This brings us to the last panel titled, How Acceptance of Belonging to a Diverse Culture Impacted My Development. I would like to invite, okay, Mr. Lissar, class of 1984, El Mark School of Ugarhu, Chief Academic Officer at MC. And Mr. Mohammed Al Harmi, class of 2000, Al Mawak School of Al Bersha, Director of Corporate Development Department in Mohammed Bin Rashid Space Center. All yours, Ms. Elisa. All right, I am very honored to have the seasoned, if you will, alumni on this panel. These are the alumni who were mostly around, I think, graduated before the class of 2018 was born. I think, sorry guys, but that's the reality. So I'm honored to invite to join me and Muhammad on stage, Hala Girgawi, <laughs> Dr. Nadia Bastaki, <laughs> Ilham Al Qasimi, <laughs> Hala Barghout, <laughs> Mustafa Sahaf, <laughs> Maryam Al Afridi, <laughs> and Saleh Jaziri. Awalan, Mustafa, I love what you're carrying there in your hands. It's a Mawakib notebook. <laughs> you're about like grade 37 by now. <laughs> All right, so our topic for this panel is one that is dear to my heart because it sits... All right, you know I'm going to shush at this point. Voila. Okay. This is a topic that is dear to my heart and everyone at AMSI simply because it speaks to our true values as a system and as a family. Once you reach a point in your life where you have to start making decisions, your first and foremost decision should be how am I going to accept who I am and how I'm going to accept others for who they are. From there on, the next decisions will become easier. If this acceptance does not become your daily routine, you're going to face a lot of problems. Recently, I posted a video on Instagram, I'm sure some of you saw it, about rejecting the word tolerance. And I have a rationale for that, which is I feel like you tolerate bad food. You have a tolerance for medicine. You tolerate an attitude. But you don't tolerate each other. You don't tolerate people if you care about them. People you accept. Because tolerating them is as if I'm, I'm saying I'm just putting up with you because I have to. Versus no, I want to accept you because I want to. And this is the topic that we're going to discuss today. It's going to revolve around how being in a diverse community like ours helps us develop the skills to accept and how belonging to such a community refined those skills. Okay? Shall we? You first. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank the panelists. And I know everyone here. And I say everyone. Uh, another thing, students, everyone on the tables, please drop your phones. Put your phones on the table. I don't want to see anyone playing with this phone. I'm going to go Moakib Sky. No right? No, no phones, on the, phones on the table. Uh, yes, face down, please. Uh, this is very interesting for me uh, to have such an elite group of people with us. Uh, I love looking at Mr. Denise when he smiles. <laughs> he always smiles, mashallah. 
So we'll start with our questions, but make sure you actually listen because every person on this panel has his own way of diversity. And uh, you should really listen clearly to what they have to say and then ask all the questions you want. So I will start with Saleh Al Jaziri. So Saleh is uh, the Director General of Ajman Tourism, and uh, he's a graduate of Muakib 98. Uh, good friend. Uh, so Saleh, I'll start with you. How big a role did your AMS Muakib experience play in shaping your culture cultural sensitivities. Share examples, please, with us. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Before I answer this question, uh, I'd just like to say how, how after so many years things have changed because uh, the statement Mohammed just said about your phones is something that he used to hear every day in class because he used to do the same in class. At that time, it was bleeps, it wasn't telephones, but for those of you who remember it. Tolerance and diversity are two very important words that you will face and you will hear throughout your life. Uh, whether it is something in the workforce that when you work in, in a certain environment, or it's at home dealing with, with the rest of your family. Um, Experience in AMS definitely supported because we were always put into an environment where we accept differences. We were always taught to listen to others' points of view and accept what they're saying. Not necessarily do what they're saying because at the end of the day everyone has his or her own opinion and you need to listen to what others think and how they look at stuff, their perspective, so that you can understand if yours is correct or not. Is that a good example for you? Um, Mustafa, this experience that Saleh just described about Hello. the environment. First of all, Mustafa is the lead lawyer in Majid al Futain and uh, a recent Wedding happened, so congratulations. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, so what he talked about and this experience of being in a community where embracing others and accepting them is the norm. It's not something you're being taught. It's something you grow up living. How have you taken this and carried it into university and then family and then job? Have you carried it through? Well, uh, first I'll introduce myself just so you can have a bit of perspective uh, for the answer. Um, uh, that's right, I'm a lawyer. I've been in the legal field for 10 years now. I work for Carrefour, uh, the French hypermarket chain, uh, which is owned by a UAE uh, holding company. Before Al Mawakib, I joined Mawakib in grade 10. Before that, I grew up in Canada, uh, Montreal, the French side of Canada. And after I graduated, I moved back to Canada, and uh, I lived in the UK as well, in several cities, and as well as Dubai. So what Mawakib taught me, and, and, and before I joined Mawakib, I was very embedded in the, in the French-Canadian culture. What Mawakib taught me was the UAE culture as well, a different perspective, a different side, a different culture. Um, not necessarily mine, but one that I embrace, just like I embrace all the other cultures um, th th that I was a part of later on in my life. And today, this helps me in my professional life uh, uh, in, 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 at, at uh, Carrefour because I work with um, UAE nationals who treat me like one of their own because I, I've um, em embraced the UAE culture. A lot of my friends I've met in Al Mawakib are from the UAE, like Mohammed, for example. He is my best friend. <laughs> And, um, and that's how it helps me. It gave me a, a different perspective, just like before and after gave me a different perspective as well. Thank you, Mustafa. Uh, Hala, I have a question for you. So how vital is it? Oh. Sorry. 
Sorry, my bad. So, uh, hello, Greta. How are you? I'm good. Oh, good. Good to see you again. Drop the mic. <laughs> so, how vital is acceptance in your daily life? How does it realize? Um, if I may start with uh, maybe just a brief on my background. So um, I was among the first batch um, of Zaid University, and I was the only student from Al Mawakib School. And that by itself, I mean, we all fear, we have the fear of uh, going into university, but uh, friends help. Um, and I had Amna Bunwas who was supposed to come with me, and uh, she decided to do medicine. And um, I went into a totally different community, a community full of Emirati um, girls um, who 95% uh, never heard of, his, of my school, Mawakib. And uh, we were, in total, we were only 12 girls from uh, different private schools in Dubai. So that by itself was a struggle for me. Um, I finished Zaid University. Uh, the first year was a struggle, and then I managed uh, to actually uh, um, adapt. Um, and then I was uh, the third um, employee to work at the Hamdan bin Muhammad E University. Uh, it's the first electronic, accredited electronic university, online university. And basically, it was a chancellor, vice chancellor, and website designer, because that's what you need to do a university. Um, so, uh, uh, after Hamdan bin, uh, Hamdan bin Muhammad University, I, I was working for five years and I decided that I need, it was time to do my master's. So I traveled abroad, uh, I did my MBA at Cass Business School, and I came back, I decided that I don't want to do a government, uh, uh, I don't want to work for the government, and I wanted to do my own business, and I started a publishing house. And that led me um, to be um, selected to, uh, uh, for the post of editor-in-chief of anazahra.com, the first online website in the Middle East, uh, for three years. And in 2014, I was um, appointed as the editor-in-chief of Maj uh, Zahra al Khalij magazine, which is uh, the oldest magazine in the region as well. Uh, it's 39 years old. So I am today um, uh, the editor-in-chief of a magazine that is three years older than I am. So yeah, that's my career. From information, I studied information systems. So inf from information systems, I uh, moved to media. So the question was, um, so how acceptance how vital in my daily life. First of all, the video that you mentioned, the, the, the video that you posted about accepting people and not tolerating them, that's my favorite video. And I've been quoting you since that day that you posted it. Uh, and it's really, I mean, uh, life is all about acceptance. You have to accept everyone. You have to accept the way your mother is, uh, the way your father is. And my father, until today, he says, the biggest mistake I did is sending you to UK. And that's the best thing that happened to my life. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm not upset that he still says that. Uh, I accept the way he is. I accept the way he, um, I mean, it's his mindset, the way he grew up. So you have to accept. And when you accept, you feel relieved. Um, so I, I don't, I felt I talked so much, so I don't know. I think I answered your question. Yeah, more than Margot. So I, I always call her Bargut Aslan. <laughs> so, Hala. Yes. How important was this culture okay. in your personal and professional life? Okay. This panel in itself is quite diverse. We have the UAE nationals, we have Iraq, we have Canada, we have Lebanon, we have uh, a mix of uh, female, male, uh, different. It's, it's quite a diverse right there. Young, old, <laughs> very old. <laughs> okay, so, so how has it impacted? Okay. So I'm Hala, thank you for having me. Uh, a quick introduction. Um, I think I'm the only person in here who has um, studied um, medicine or basically something related to medicine, which is, which is nutrition. So I'm in, I'm in the health uh, industry. Um, I was born in the UAE um, and I lived here for six years. I went to Shreifat. Moakab exists then. I think, oh, oh, you did exist, I'm sorry. But we were in Sharjah. We were just lost in that <laughs> we were stage. In 
Okay, then um, my family moved to Lebanon, uh, where I'm from, and uh, uh, put us in an American school, which was mixed. And I studied there for 10 years. Then when my, my family decided to move back here, we joined Mawakab. Now, I think I'm in the right group, uh, the, the right uh, panelist, panel group, because it was a major culture shock to me when I moved from Lebanon, being in a mixed school, to a segregated school in Dubai. But um, having brought up in, in Lebanon and being around Lebanese only in school, of course with maybe Canadian and American teachers, but we never mixed or mingled or hung out with non-Lebanese, or maybe very few. Um, being in Mawakib and having studied three years, in my high school years in Mawakib, taught me so much because I was exposed to um, people from completely different nationalities. And my class was majority um, Emirati. This helped me so much in my future because after studying nutrition and dietetics and um, going into consulting and uh, helping people one-on-one, -on -one, majority Emirati, men and women, uh, made me feel the sense of belonging, made me feel like, okay, I'm comfortable talking to these people because I know how they live. I know how their cultures are at home. Um, I know how they were raised, how they eat, uh, their form of behaviors, whether it's health, whether it's upbringing, etc. So it made me feel like I, I was lucky. I was lucky to have moved to Dubai and to go, I was lucky to have been at, at Mawakib, even though back then I felt it was going to be a major nightmare. So um, thank you, thank you, and it wasn't at all, it wasn't. Thank you, Ala. Uh, Dr. Nadia, uh, I have a question for you. So how, how being a doctor, the, how has being embedded in a diverse culture shaped you? Um, so first of all, I'd like to say good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Nadia. 20 years ago, if, uh, Ustaz Omar or anyone, Elisa herself would say, Nadia, a doctor, mustahil. Uh, this was me because in school I was so kind of all over the place. Um, the people knew me because I would rap, Tidrilish is alalik, you know? And I used to do many things um, uh, that was Nadia. Nadia was, uh, was all about exploring herself. And Al Mawakib School gave me the space and the, the way that I could explore myself. I remember before coming to Mawakib, I was a, I was a kind of an experiment child. So I was the second child. So uh, my mom said, no, you know, I, I don't know with Nadia, let's do something different. Okay, so initially we went to a school where it was all UA nationals, but it was all like family. I knew all the kids there, their moms knew the moms, and then I went there and then my mom decided, not really, I want something different for Nadia. Then she took me to a, a government school. Over there, uh, I had also uh, UAE nationals, but it was a different type of UAE nationals. So I was the first one who went to school with the short skirts and ribbons and stuff, and they said, you know, where is your Hela Hope at that time, where is your stockings? You can't walk in. I was in grade two, you know, and I was like, where am I? And from there, I was like, oh, okay, this is not me. This is really not me. And then finally, in grade three, my mom decided to take me to Mawakib. And I remember my first day in Al Mawakib school, where I felt, this is home. I don't know why, but there was something about Al Mawakib school which which showed, and mainly it was the love, the welcoming, the big hugs of Miss Nasr, you know, teddy bear hugs. It was amazing. The welcoming and happy kind of energy and positive things that were happening. All the school was colorful with boards and colors. And I felt, this is me, you know, I can, I can do whatever I want here. So I did exactly what I want there. So I wanted to explore. I wanted to get to know people, I wanted to get to know different cultures, and I embedded in the Lebanese culture, so I was all about Zatar, Manaish, and Dibke, all the way, okay? 
I spoke Lebanese till death, uh, you know, and um, and then I was like, I wanted to know people, I wanted to know their cultures, I, I embraced. So I had UAE national friends, but my best friends today are also non-UAE nationals, so have uh, Lebanese, Egyptians, and we went out and we had fun and we did everything together and it 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 just made me understand how when you are with different kind of cultures you accept them you don't judge them you are with them you feel family uh, you defend them and you stand by them and you feel one so it's not about creating differences it's about how can we become together as a team so when we were in school we were together and when when we came out of school, um, I went out of school and um, I shocked my mom and I said, you know, I want to become a doctor. She's like, no, Nadia, no, this is not for you. I said, I want to become a doctor. She's like, what do you mean doctor? I said, doctor, medicine. And she's like, no, please, this is not for you. And I said, no, please, this is for me. I know I can become a doctor. She said, okay, I don't want to like shock you, but medicine is a lot of hard work. And I said, yeah, what is it? I can do it. Okay, and finally I went to UK and I understood that, that there were different types of people. So when I came out of my loving Moaka diverse society, I went into a different diverse society, bigger diverse society. And when I went there, it was like about different people, different beliefs, different faith, different culture, different bringing, bringing upbringing. And it's so important that you hold yourself, that you hold your values, your faith, your culture. So when I went abroad, it was like, come on, let's party. And I'm like, I never partied. You know, what does party mean? No, you can come with us to the nightclub, and all, but this is not me. But I stood my grounds because I was, I believed in my own culture. So I did what was right for me. You know, there was a lot of ways and people accepted me for what I was. So I used to tell them, no, I can't go to the parties, but you know, we can go to coffee, we can go to dinner, we can go to a movie, we can go to bowling. And uh, so a lot of things taught me that I have to stand for my values, for what has what has been there. So it's important when you go into different cultures and diversify and become bigger and ex it's important that you hold yourself. You become ambassadors, as Reem was saying. You're ambassadors not only to your country, but to the family, to your values, to the faith that they brought you. So, and because you, you know, when you go abroad and you meet different people and you want to be a part of them, don't change your values for the people. You know, keep your values at the core because they make you who you are today. So it's very important that even though you grow, grow, uh, go abroad and meet people, and being open-minded is not imitating people. Being open-minded is educating yourself. Being open-minded is accepting other people's culture, religion, difference. And it's not about being same. It's about being different and being accepted. Thank you, Nadia. <coughs> Ilham, wow, So Ilham will tell you a little bit about herself briefly, but I, the one thing I like to keep saying about her is that uh, if you all don't know, she is the first woman to trek solo to the North Pole, and of course, first Arab to trek solo to the North Pole. She is also the first Arab UAE national to carry the Olympic flame for a leg during the London Olympics. Yep. She is a lot of things and uh, she is dear to my heart. And you want to say something about her? I remember one thing about Alham. I remember you got a very high score in SAT and it always stayed in my head. High score in what, SAT? Yes. Yeah, I think it was yeah, the I highest, right? I think you right? aced it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. You made his life miserable that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ilham, to you I say, um, and this is something a lot of you might have experienced, so pay attention to this, because in diversity there often comes controversy. Uh, it leads to controversy, so 
there are scenarios where you have to decide and pick your battles and see how you're going to handle this. Have you had such a scenario and how did you handle it? Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for your time and your attention today. Um, I know you're all making important decisions and some of this you may want to hear or not. Very briefly, um, after I left Mawakib, I studied here at the American University and then went, went to London, uh, studied at the London School of Economics, and then started a career in investment banking in JP Morgan in London. I lived there for seven years, and during that journey of working, studying and working in an international environment and challenging my own understanding of what's normal, what's diversity, what is true respect and understanding, um, I came full circle. And part of the journey of closure was doing that expedition to the North Pole where I wanted to spend, you know, true time with myself, listening to the voice within. When I came back, I continued a career in the corporate world. I joined Mubadala Investment Company, and today I manage a portfolio in the, investing in the tech sector. So for all you people on Snapchat and all of that, it's my job to evaluate the value of Snapchat and decide whether to put money in it. If you're deciding whether to buy stock, come talk to me later. Um, so it's been quite the journey. I found myself often pushing the boundaries and the limits. I was the first Emirati ever to work at JP Morgan. No one in my family ever moved abroad to pursue a career. Um, the North Pole, I don't need to say more. And then with Mubadala, I'm the most senior female executive um, director there. And the portfolio I manage is more than $20 billion worth. So constantly pushing the, the barriers. And there have been many inc incidences where maybe someone doesn't understand or like that, or where I had to get to know and accommodate myself to something new that was unfamiliar or uncomfortable to me and decide which way to proceed. Um, if, I, if I were to pick just one, uh, somewhere in my career I was asked to um, enter the leadership team of one of our investment companies, which is Emirates Global Aluminium, which is one of the top five aluminium producers in the world, for those of you who don't know, here in the UAE. Um, and I was responsible for integrating two companies, Duval and Imal, into one company and managing all the people dynamics to do with that. Um, I was the only woman in the top 100 of that company, and I was the youngest and the first ever in the executive team. Um, I came from a world where, you know, you were judged by your performance and how hard you work and the outcomes you achieve. But in that environment, which was very much um, a slightly more old school, I would say, environment, sometimes it didn't matter how good what you did was. What mattered is who you are, where you came from, what you look like. So I had one great challenge, which was to, um, uh, to gain acceptance from uh, the leadership team very quickly so they would trust me to execute the merger. And one member of the leadership team did not under any circumstance. And the way he saw the world, which is just the way he saw the world, is that there was absolutely no place for a lady in that team, much less someone of my age and, um, and my background. And maybe for the first six months, I tried so hard through hard work to gain his respect and collegiate uh, manner. But I kept getting, uh, a, a, you know, a door slammed in the face. And eventually I realized that, you know, lack of acceptance of diversity, say for example, in a leadership team or in a company, is not something either to identify with or to be a victim of. And what that means is neither should I accept his lack of tolerance, nor should I identify with it by being the same as him by pushing back at the same level of lack of diversity. And I knew I had been raised at Moakib at home and in my professional experience to be better than that. And I also believe that no matter how much someone wants to stand in your way, they won't be successful unless it was meant to be. Um, and so I just accepted him for the way he was, and I stopped responding to the pushback. And I'd say that was a two and a half year journey, at the end of which, um, I got a massive pat on the back from our leadership. I got promoted, and he was asked to leave the company. Oh, I see. There you go. So, so it worked. respecting oh, someone, even when they don't 
offer you that courtesy back is an important part of diversity. You answered my question because it was going to be, I hope he got fired. So I'm glad uh, that he did. Um, all of you girls out there, uh, silence the voices in your lives that tell you because you're a girl, there are things you cannot do. All right. You have seen so many examples today of such women. Those who didn't listen. On this panel, I've got like now three, and I'm sure, Hala, you have your stories of you stood up to negatives and you said, no, I'm going to do it. So good on you. And it takes, by the way, great men like the guys on the panel too, and a lot of your MC boys here to understand and appreciate the value of a woman and her role in society. So definitely the boys are important too. All right, so I'm not going to ask any more questions. Only one that I'm going to shock my, uh, yes, sir. I was going to shock him with a question. Uh, we will, I think there's a lot of curiosity about it. He will. But before he does, and then I'm going to, they want to ask you a lot of questions. So I'm going to leave it with them. But I'm going to ask you, what do you love the most about being in a diverse community? And I know Mustafa is your friend, Dufiras is your friend, Dunayef, and I remember this group, Wahala, Kullon, they're your friends. But these kids here, these young seniors, need to understand how important it is to build connections with people in your life, no matter where they're from, who they are. Okay. Uh, I'll answer this question first, and then I'll ask, answer Ms. Denise's question. Um, first of all, uh, being surrounded by people from, from different cultures taught me a lot in my career. Uh, having friends from coming from different backgrounds, different cultures, different countries, uh, uh, made me even a way better leader. Understanding every person's culture made me learn one word, and that's respect. So, I uh, naturally, when you learn about, uh, like I was a Moakab for sure, uh, we have people from different cultures, different countries, and each house has a different culture. It's not only each family. Each house, each couple, a group of friends, they all share different cultures, different mindsets, different way of thinking. So how do you make this solid? I have Mustafa here. Uh, I've known him since he moved to Dubai, grade 10. Uh, he's been my best friend till this day. And he's from Iraq slash Canadian. Uh, I have friends from Sudan, which are my best friends. I have friends that are non-Muslim. I have friends that are, that are Koreans. I have friends from all around the world. But my best friends are people who I started my life with in Muwaka. We've been best friends for over 22 years. We are still the same group. You have different tables here. I bet you anything, most of the people here won't be friends for this long. So having that group of people with a solid uh, foothold is something that, it's like a flower, when you open a flower, when the flower opens, you see different, they, they all go in a different way, right? but it's still stuck together. So this, uh, and living abroad, this is about my friends. I have to talk about my friends because they're my family. And how did it start? It started the Mawakib. And who was my family before that? Ms. Nasr, Mr. Nabil, Mr. Nabur, Ms. Mahasan, Mr. Nisar, definitely Mr. Denise, Mr. George. Everyone gave us that core, which is respect, trust, love. From that, of course, each person develops his way on his own way. Development is something that comes with time. How you do it, when you do it, where you do it, is something that 
it's a decision that you make. Uh, but just to sum it up, uh, having a diverse culture helps you understand different culture, makes you respect different cultures, and makes you understand how living abroad would never change your own culture, you just evolve with it. And that's the first answer. For Mr. Adenis's question, so I'll give you a summary of what happened. Last week, I'm sure you all saw something flying off the sky. Everyone said it's an Isaac. Some people said it's something on fire. Some people said uh, it's space junk, Mithio, and people started talking. So I received a call from the Dubai Media Office. Like, Ahmed, what is this? I was like, of course, I won't give you a sudden answer. I have to do my analysis. So we realized that there are rockets. Everything that goes to space eventually falls down. Uh, so it was a rocket, Soyuz rocket. Uh, it's a Russian rocket. Uh, it was, it was uh, on its way to the ISS, the International Space Station. So just to make it simple, the rocket has three stages. So the two stages, the first two stages goes down to Earth. You do the trajectory or before that, I'll go to Delta V, which I sure, Mr. Denise, when you taught me physics, you're like, no way. Muhammad, his dream was, was to be a football player, he got to space, which uh, I'm proud of. And I lived in South Korea, Ms. Susan is smiling. I lived in South Korea for eight years. Uh, so basically, the first, uh, that was the first part of the, of the rocket, fell off, and it was way far. People saw it from Bravi, people saw it from Ain, people saw it from Dubai, so it definitely wasn't falling in Dubai, common sense, so it fell in Oman. And it's not uh, anything else if you hear rumors. So it's a rocket, a Russian rocket. Okay, so that brings this panel to an end from this side. And we're now going to open it up to questions. And I saw the first hand right there, maybe because I'm facing this way. I'm sorry. Mania, you have microphones? microphones, Stand up, young man. Uh, hello, first of all, my name is Saif Ali. I'm a student in Mark Barsha. <laughs> now, uh, I know this may go against the rules a bit, but I honestly have two questions that have been bugging me the whole conference. And they're mainly directed, the first one directed to Miss uh, Hala. Okay. There's um, two. Uh, Hala Bargut, Hala El Gergawi. Okay. Uh, Miss, I wanted to add, uh, ask in specific, when, when I grow up, I plan on writing a book and I want to actually publish it. I just wanted to ask you, what are the hardships of publishing um, especially in, an ad, uh, in like places uh, abroad, not necessarily the UAE. And my second question was directed to Mr. Mustafa. Uh, sir, I just wanted to ask you, uh, one of uh, my interests in a job was actually law, okay? And I always talk about law specifically to my family, other friends, but they've always been demotivating me towards it. They've always been telling me that it's uh, hard to start your own firm and it's uh, luck determines how you get into law and stuff. I just wanted to know your thoughts on that specific. Yeah. Um, I, I know. Okay, uh, so publishing a book, of course there, is a lot, there are a lot of phases before getting into publishing the book. There's the editing, the proofreading, and then finding a publisher. Um, actually today, Sharjah, I don't know if anyone heard, Sharjah launched their um, free zone publishing, uh, publishing free zone. Sheikh Sultan launched it today. And uh, that is an amazing opportunity for all the writers. Uh, publishing is not, is not a hard, it's not difficult. Um, and um, the, the problem comes later on with the distribution and sales, and this is the harder part, which is more like marketing, which would you know, require marketing. But publishing a book is definitely, it, it's a very easy process. 
but then you struggle with the distribution and the sales. But of course, your book has to be good. Right? So I think that is the first sign whether you're going to have an easy pathway or not, I'm going to guess. Mustafa. Yes. So your question is that others have discouraged you. Sorry. So your question was that um, others have discouraged you about studying law. Now you see law is competitive, but so is every other field you're going to go into. Um, they tell you that you can't open your own law firm. It's very difficult to do so. Well, I haven't opened my own law firm either. You see, there are different branches of law. There's banking law, there's private firm, and there's in-house um, um, in house company law. So the field is big. Sure, it's competitive, but if you really um, enjoy what you do, you can go uh, 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 far away. Now, it's easy to discourage even after you study law, but if you, if you find the niche that you enjoy, uh, it could be very rewarding. So yes, I encourage you to, to take law, or at least try it out and see how you, how you feel about it at least. I think so. Don't despair. If this is what you want to do, you go for it. Of course. What, what was your name, Ahmed or Saif? Uh, so if a lot of people would discourage you and say, you know, you can't do this, um, then you look at yourself and look at your passion. You listen to your inner voice and see what exactly you want to do. If you love something, you will, you will succeed in it. And if you believe that you love the passion and you have passion about law, whether it's difficult, whether it's hard, you will succeed. I studied seven years of medicine, and then I did my postgraduate studies, and all the people around me was like, you can't become a doctor, it's difficult, it's not for you. And I did medicine, and I, I was the top three graduated from the university. I came out from uh, university, I did aviation medicine. I'm the only UAE national and the only woman in the Middle East with the aviation medicine speciality. And I'm one of the only executives in Etihad Airways as a female I started, and I'm I'm actually heading the medical and well-being in Etihad Airways. So a lot of people discouraged me many times, but I didn't listen because I know in my heart I can become what I am today. And life will face you with a lot of challenges, but you proceed and you believe in yourself and you can do it. Any other questions? Hello, my name is Yasmeen Isa, and I'm a student in al Mawakib Barsha. My question is did, okay. My question is directed especially to Mr. Mustafa. What are some fundamental things I can uh, pursue or I can do before entering law school? It's like it's something I could to prepare me for law school, either mental or academic preparation. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> As, as far as preparation goes, you see, I, I would say take the courses first and then see how you like it because as far as preparation goes, um, it, it's academic. It's going to be just the same as, as, as other fields, whether you're studying engineering or whether you're studying law or medicine. Um, uh, the characteristics you can say of, of, a, of a lawyer would be attention to detail. It's, it's not exactly rocket science. It's nothing too difficult. It's just a, a lot of work, a lot of uh, uh, organization skills. Uh, uh, sure, a lot of reading and, uh, and uh, attention to detail, like I said. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Not all of it. I studied uh, tax law and I didn't find it interesting. Um, um, I'm not interested, for example, to open my own uh, law firm. Uh, there are many fields, so I would say go into the field and, and, and study it and read it and, and, and see what, which part you like the best. Maybe but if any, any of you interested in, in law, please, I, I um, ask him later. Yeah, please. Uh, Maybe we also can do some it research in more on, the, on the different uh, fields that mm -hmm. you can get into in law, because there are so many different branches. And uh, Mustafa is available I'm at happy, some point I'm for email if you want to talk some yeah. more about that. Anytime. We have a question here. 
Uh, good afternoon. My question is, uh, grades are achievable, but how can you guarantee success? Saleh and then Ilham will have something to say about this, and Hala Barwood. I'm not sure why he chose me for this. Um, he chose you. Faisal was talking about a C minus that he can remember. Um, I can remember an A minus, but that wasn't my grades, it's my blood test, so. Um, just before I answer that question, it's actually a very good question. Guys, the boys in this room, can I have your attention, please? I can see the ladies are all facing us and they're interested in what we're saying, but the boys are giving us their backs and playing with their phones or playing with their headgear. So guys, can you actually turn your seats and face us so that you can listen to what we're saying? So those of you whose backs are to the stage, turn around, please. I know it's late, you guys want to go home. We have a little bit more experience in, in what you'll be facing because we've been there. Um, and we're only here because we want to support you guys, not because we want our pictures taken. The question that was asked is, you can guarantee grades, but how can you guarantee success? You can guarantee success by making sure you don't stop. There's no harm in failing. It will only teach you how to be stronger. And they say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. There are so many times that you would actually try to do something and maybe not reach the level that you wanted to or the, the goal that you wanted to. But you will keep on trying until the day you reach that stage. And that's because you did not fail to stop. The day you stop is the day you fail. Even if you don't get the grades, or if you do get the grades, continue moving and make sure you reach the goal, because once you reach the goal, you've succeeded in that task, but you have many others that you need to succeed to. So continue moving forward. Thank you. We have one more question here. Uh, hi, my name is Rashid al Marri from uh, Muakab al Barsha. Uh, <laughs> Um, talking about differences in everyday ways, demonstrate uh, respect, value, uh, values, individual characteristics, and helps build an inclusive environment. How did your experience throughout life culturally develop you to the man or woman you are today? We're going to need to have it repeated. We didn't really hear it properly. So and s read it slowly, please. Enunciate. Yalla. Um, talking about differences in everyday ways demonstrates respect, values individual characteristics, and helps build an inclusive environment. How did your experience throughout life culturally develop you to the man or woman you are today? We sort of addressed this in our conversation, so this is, maybe Elham, you'll take this. So, being in an inclusive community builds characteristics. How did you use the characteristics that were built in your environment and in your everyday life? Did I kind of nail it a little bit? Is that close? Okay, good. Yeah. Sure. Um, I might build off a little bit what Saleh was talking about. So each and every one of those experiences will shape you. And at every single juncture, you have a choice. The cho one choice is to question it. Why did this happen to me? Nothing ever goes my way. Why are they doing this to me? Those sort of questions. Why is this so hard? Um, why don't I have a scholarship? That guy got a scholarship. I want to go study in that university. Why am I not studying that, that topic? That's one attitude you can take to each of those experiences and the challenges in your journey. The other is to know that if you take the learning from each of those, they make the beauty and the strength inside you shine even brighter. I know we all think when we're finishing high school, we're at our prime. It's once you have multiple of those experiences under your belt that you will be at your prime. And you will know when you're at your prime because people always respond to people who carry themselves with the 
dignity and the humility and the grace of someone who learns from their mistakes and their failures and from whatever life throws in their way, even if it's not their fault. So I think for me, the answer is if those things didn't happen, you would never reach your full potential. We have a question on this side. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Shamal Attar. I've got two questions, it's a general question. So when do we start achieving our bigger goals and what's the first step towards, it, towards them? Uh, the second question is, how do I get recognized if, uh, in the workplace and university if the competition in the major I chose is highly demanded by students? Maybe I can say something. Um, so some people have ultimate goals they want to get to and they reach stages in life where they still feel they need to get to that goal. Um, I've had many goals in my life and they were short term. Um, being an entrepreneur, I feel that I always want to do more and achieve more. So maybe my goals were a little achievable in the past, but now my goals are a lot bigger and it, it's never, I mean, I don't have to be at a certain age to have, it, to have and achieve my goals. Um, I still feel, uh, I mean, I want to work harder and uh, maybe I, I'll be able to achieve my goal at 45 or 40 or even 50. But as long as I'm happy, I'm working hard, I feel I'm going down the success route, then that's just making me happier and making me closer to achieving my, my goal ultimately. Another question. Okay. Saleh, go ahead. Another question. Yalla, Saleh. Just to add on to that, um, you said a very specific word, our bigger goals. Um, the word bigger is a very vague word. Um, it is you who decides on what the bigger goal is, and it's not others who expect it from you. You need to know what the goal you want to reach is and when you want to reach it. Your bigger goal could be being a minister or your bigger goal could be living happily with the family at home. It's you who makes sure which goal you want to reach and when you want to reach it. And, and the second question of um, how can you excel in a marketplace that a lot of people uh, have the same, same background um, competitiveness uh, for, uh, as another word you need to make sure that your voice is heard and your voice will be heard by people around you so make sure that you have everyone's support and make sure you work as a team because it's the team that will actually push you to go higher so it, it's easy. It's easy for you to say, "Yes, I'm a I'm a great student, or I have great capabilities." But if you work alone, you won't reach to the top. As as the saying is, "One hand doesn't clap." Oh, thank you, Saleh. Mania. Okay, we have a question here. Hi, my name is Lujain, and uh, from Garhud, and I have a question for Elham. What inspired you to go to the North Pole and like how did people react to this thing? Let's see, the North Pole, um, I'm going to try and say it very quick because I could do a long discussion on that. Um, I knew that I needed to push myself out of my comfort zone. Uh, because I had succeeded in anything I had put my mind to that was academic or professional. And so I wanted a challenge that was neither academic nor professional and something that I hadn't necessarily proven myself in in the past. It was for me, it was an internal goal. It was something I wanted to do without relying on my support network. I was very social and very close to my family. And so I often did everything, you know, in groups with a lot of encouragement from my friends and family. Um, and so I wanted to see what it would be like to ski in silence 14 hours a day where you can't even have an iPod because it's frozen and the only encouragement you have is your own willpower. That was why I did it. 
And the reaction, as you can imagine, was similar to what we discussed today. Um, not everyone necessarily thought it was a good idea. Um, I didn't get, to be honest, I didn't get support from anyone in the beginning. <laughs> None of my, even my friends, they said, uh, really, in how North Pole, you know there's no place to plug your hairdryer in there. You know, you're going to be dirty for all those days. Can you handle that? So even people who knew me really, really thought I couldn't do it. Uh, professionals said you need a year to train. Um, there was all sorts of reasons why I couldn't do it. But in my mind, I could do it. And I, all I can say is the challenge was in my mind, not, not the physical part of it. And that's something that I carry with me always, um, everywhere. And the last point I would say is you can't forsake your family when you're trying to do something that in your own heart is on the verge of impossible. And so I think if I didn't manage to get the support of my family, my father and my mother in particular, I, I probably wouldn't have been successful. Um, and, you know, I personally always cook an entire target until I'm sure I'm going to do it before I talk to anyone about it. Because as the rest of the panel has pointed out, there will always be naysayers. There will always be people that, actually most people will say you can't do it because if they thought they could, maybe they would have done it themselves. And it's okay that they don't think it's possible. That's their life, but then you have your dream. So you have to be confident and sure of your dream and how you're going to achieve it before you start talking to people about it and they sort of pollute your conviction to go ahead. I think we'll take only one last question. Hi, Mr. Adonis. One. Hello, everyone. My name is Wait, Abdullah. One second, please. One second. On the actual expedition? Yeah. So his question was, how many times did I think about going back while I was on the expedition? Stopping and returning. Yeah. Um, it's funny. It was the first day. And what happened was, <laughs> um, so you go to a base camp, which is a floating station, Russian station on ice. You pack all your gear, and then a, a helicopter drops you off at 89 degrees north latitude on the Arctic Ocean, no land. You're floating on ice over the sea. Um, and so the first day, um, you know, we were skiing, and I'm excited, and everything is beautiful. It looks different to what I expected. And then, um, you know, six hours in, I started feeling like my head was drooping. I started to feel really heavy and lethargic. And uh, I pushed forward for another mile. And then after about a mile, I just dropped to my knees. And the doubt kicked in, right? So I said, what am I doing here? Who did I think I was to be here? Obviously, I could never do this. All these thoughts started going through my head. And then the guide came to me and said, what are you doing? And I said, can we set up camp here? And he said, no. We've Cross six nautical miles true north. We need to do eight nautical miles today to stay on track because we would run out of food if we didn't. What's wrong? And I said, I, I feel really dizzy and lethargic. And he said, show me your food pack. And in the course of the day, I had eaten like one Snickers bar with six hours of skiing. And water, I had drunk about that much from my water bottle. And so it was just lack of awareness of my environment. And, uh, and I didn't really anticipate the physical challenge of the cold because the cold was so cold that if I stopped for more than three minutes, my fingers would freeze. And it was so cold that all my food was frozen. And so I couldn't take a bite out of the food. Um, so they shared their snacks with me and everyone stopped and allowed me to hydrate. And then um, when we continued going back to teamwork, um, we always ski single file, one behind the other. Two of, two of the people with me skied next to me. One of them, Italian doctor, really good friends with uh, Andrea Bocelli. And so he started singing opera for me to keep me going since there's no music. And, um, and the other, I didn't know, but I saw a picture later. He was helping me with my sled because I'm carrying a sled. The sled was 42 kilos. I weighed 49 kilos at the time. So he was helping carry the weight. And so teamwork got me through. And then when I got to, to camp, I very simply evaluated what went wrong. And I categorically and methodically corrected it. So I would sit at night and chop my snacks into tiny bite-sized pieces and have them in a place where I can keep eating without stopping. 
Um, and many, many tricks like this I, I took advantage of. And, and I never, ever doubted ever again that I would make it. Omar, your next adventure. Um, we have one last question, that's it. But I wanted to say that among the panelists today was also another adventurer, Omar Derbez. We didn't get to touch on his ginormous accomplishment last year. So now, you know, uh, Ilham is throwing it at you, Omar. Maybe next trip is to the North Pole. Tell us what you did Maybe. last year. Uh, last year, I joined the, uh, the toughest foot race in the world in uh, the Sahara Desert. It's a 250 kilometer run. Uh, running up to, it was plus 50 degrees in the desert, yeah. It was a six day challenge. Um, based on your question, I, Mr. Denise just asked me the same question. Um, on the second day, I ended up in the infirmary. I was dehydrated and I was there for four or five hours. I wasn't planning to quit, but I was hoping they get me out. They, they say, you can't continue. But once they gave me the green light, I, uh, I pushed through. So I never thought of quitting. I was just hoping they pulled me out, to be honest. <laughs> uh, the longest day was 80 kilometers. So it's a stage, yeah. This is just walking, Omar? Or no, running? No, it's a ra running. Running. Uh, you can run and walk. Yeah, you can combine running and walking. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And this is for six days of nonstop. Six days, yeah. And you have a time limit per stage. And... Uh, Sorry? Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a time limit per stage, so the uh, longest day is 84 kilometers. It took, uh, took me 24 hours. Wow. MashaAllah. Yeah. So hopefully we have a lot of adventurers someday that we hear about in this crowd. I think that's it. We'll take one very, very last question if there is one. Otherwise, we will call it the day today. Is there a last question? Yes. Yes. That's it. Uh, here. Oh, in the back. And that's it. The last one. Go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Abdullah Nasser. I'm from Al Mawakab Al Garhoud. Oh, in the morning it was way louder. What happened? Oh. Wait, who's, who's Garhoud here? Barsha, are you still here? Isas. Yay! We, need, we always give them a little bit more support. They're the minority. Go ahead, gentlemen. Okay, so I wanted to ask this question since morning. So, if any of you have ever lived in a close family, how do you adapt to that transition from your father reading your decisions to you fully responsible of your decisions that would own your outcomes? So, if you live in a family where the parents father or mother are usually in charge of your decisions and it's difficult for them to let go. How do you transition to come out of that? Hala, you know about this. All right, hear us out. We're in the last few minutes, please, before we take off. Okay, so I always... Hala, you were in this exact scenario. Exactly, yeah. So I always wanted to study uh, media. <laughs> we're all leaving soon. So I always wanted to study media, and I actually applied uh, at the university for media, and when my dad found out, he said no, and there is no discussion. You have to study anything else, do business, IT, anything, but not media. Uh, media is not for girls. So I accepted, and I said, um, I'm, I'm going to try, and I did. I tried, I did information systems, and I was into networking, going under tables, and Java programming, things I don't remember today, but I did that. And I ended up in media. The, the, I mean, you have to find out what you're passionate about. You really need to find out your passion. And uh, it will come to you. I, I, didn't, I, I really didn't choose the media field, but it came to me because this is what I'm interested in from the beginning. So, so don't make your pa parents, uh, don't argue. You can convince them, but you don't have to fight for it because at the end you're going to get it. Ah, after okay, time. that's good advice actually. That's very good advice. Okay, خلاص now we're... One, one, one. One, one, okay. كيف أقول لك لا يعني هند صديقي. Together, together. واسطة لهند صديقي, يلا. Who, Sally said use your واسطة, they're using our واسطة. You are entitled 100%. 
Um, hello, my name is Hiba Saeed. Uh, I'm a senior in Al-Mawakib Barsha, and my question is for Dr. Nadia. Since I personally want to study medicine, uh, I want to ask, do you recommend us studying in the UAE or abroad, and why? Um, and as well as her question, I just wanted to ask, since some of you already studied abroad, what struggles have you faced in trying to fit in and becoming accustomed to their cultures and traditions? Okay, so Alisar told me very quickly, I can't speak quickly, but I'll try, okay? So uh, medicine is, um, when, I, when I decided to study abroad, there were not enough universities in Dubai to study medicine. So at that time, I decided to study abroad because there were schools and they were recognized. Medicine is all about understanding medicine and learning your basics. What is important is your speciality. So that's what exactly makes you a doctor. So the core is not important. The core is important, yes, but it will be how much you put into it. So I'll give you a quick example when we were interns. And it was me from UK, and there was a girl from UAE University, and there were a girl from Dubai University, and there was a girl from Ireland University. And the professor or the doctor asked us one question. Two of us knew how to answer, and the rest were like, I don't, what? What was it? So it does not really depend where you studied, how much you put into your education, how much you take out of that university. So that is important. And for the girl who said the challenges, or oh, the challenges, I was 17, 16, 17 when I went abroad. And, and the first time I was like, okay, what do I do? So I did my own laundry. Uh, I paid my own bills. I had to do my own cooking. I had to find out my transport and then buy the bus, uh, bus pass and, and make my own friends. Uh, nobody's there to tell you what's right and wrong. And uh, you'll face so many challenges. You know, you'll get this pocket money. I remember I used to get this pocket money every month. And once it was uh, maybe beginning of the month and I had zero because I actually shopped and had fun and went everywhere. And then I had 15 days of no money. And then I was like, how am I going to eat? And how am I going to survive? So what I used to do is I would buddy with friends. Oh, where are you going today? Are you guys going somewhere? I'll, I'll join you and I would eat with them. But it teaches you how to actually manage your money, how to manage your time, how to spend time, how to study, how to make groups. And it, it was challenging because you don't have someone to guide you on a daily basis. You miss home, you miss your friends. But it also teaches you how to be independent and how to mature very quickly and how to embrace uh, new cultures and then be not tolerant, but be acceptant and respect people. So. Um, Wherever you go, it doesn't matter. You'll, fail the sa you'll face the same challenges, but it's, it matters what you do in the end. Okay? This gentleman right here went to South Korea. He didn't even speak the language. So the challenges will always be there. It's about what you make of them. All right? So you can either decide, oh, no, that's too much. I'm going to go home. Or decide, no, no, this looks good. I like the food. I'm going to learn the language. Okay, that's what you did, right? You like the food. All right. Okay, kimchi, that's right. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we'll finish with this. I want to thank you all for being here. You came a long way. Wait, we're not done. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. We're not done. I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because we have to uh, stand up, all of us, the panelists, look at you and tell you thank you for being uh, very, very patient with us all day and for listening to us. Stand up and face the students, please, all of us. And say thank you all for listening, us, listening to us and I hope I'll be making the same calls to some of you in the future to invite you to be up here to be MC Voices as well. Thank you all. I leave you with your principles to finish the day. My steering committee, I love you all. Alia, thank you for being with us. All my panelists, you rock our world. Seniors, make it a good year. Congratulations, Deja, all right? So, go on, start making your decisions and start owning your outcomes, okay? Panelists, I need you all on stage for a group picture. 
But first, we'll take this panel's picture and then you join us, please. And panelists, no one leave. I, we have a small, very small gift for each of you. <laughs> 